on your screen, you see a certificate. I collect autographs. And what you're looking at is an original document. And in the upper left-hand corner, it is signed by King George III. I'm going to be showing you another autograph at the end of this lecture. I'm Joel Farkas. Uh, I created this series of lectures called Revolutionary War Lectures, all about the founding of our country. If you want to know where I'm lecturing, send me an email. You can see my email address. If you want to know the lectures that I'm giving, go on my website, and you can see all the various lectures that I'm giving. And if you're involved with lectures, booking them, or know someone who is, please pass on my contact information. Okay. This lecture I call painting, notice it's in italics, the American Revolution. Because we're going to look at various forms of, of the arts and how they show the founding of our country. So this is our Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And of course, this is the dome. And inside of the dome are these four paintings. These paintings are 12 feet by 18 feet. Pretty big. They were done by a man named John Trumbull. And what I want to do is go over each of these four paintings because they all tell stories. First one is called the Declaration of Independence. So what are you actually looking at here? Well, on your left, the gentlemen who are seated and the few standing behind them, that's our first Congress. You see, we had a constitution before the constitution we're under today. It was called the Articles of Confederation. And so the members of Congress, as we call it, were actually appointed by the various colonial legislatures. They were not elected by the people. And so they need to elect a president. And that's the man sitting in the chair on the right of your screen, John Hancock. And as, in a way, he was actually the first president of this country. Now, a resolution is on the floor by a man named Richard Henry Lee that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. So when there's a resolution on the floor, that means there's going to be a debate. And if the resolution passes, we've just declared independence. So John Hancock, realizes this and he also realizes that hey if this resolution passes we better have something in writing which will then be printed to explain to everybody what what just happened the citizens the newspapers of course washington the colonial legislatures and overseas you can bet if we declare independence every monarchy in europe is going to be watching this so what you're seeing is, so Hancock appoints a five-man committee to write a draft. And standing in front of his desk is this committee, the tall one, kind of in the center of the five, um, is Thomas Jefferson. Looking at them on Jefferson's left on your screen is John Hancock, uh, is, uh, sorry, John Adams. And on the right is Ben Franklin. And the two in the back are Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. And so Jefferson, who was the main author of the Declaration of Independence is presenting a draft of a declaration. That's technically what you're seeing. So we have the debate and the resolution passes and we declare independence. So here's a little quiz. I, I, I know I cannot hear your answer and that's okay. On what date did we declare independence? I'll give you two hints. <laughs> the month was July and the year was 1776. So what was the date? So most people say, for obvious reasons, July 4th. But that is wrong. We actually declare independence on July 2nd, because that's the date that the resolution passed. So the question becomes, so what's with July 4th? Well, that draft, that you saw being presented to John Hancock. Now, every single word in that draft is debated. There are additions, deletions, changes, et cetera. About 30% of the original draft was changed. Finally, it gets approved, goes down the street to Dunlap printers. And he prints up what are called broadsides. You know, think of posters, about the best way to, to uh, um, explain it. No, no, no signatures yet. 
And since he gets all these papers on July 4th, he dates the broadside July 4th. So at the end of the day, we declare independence on July 2nd, but we celebrate it on July 4th. Now all these papers were also rewritten by hand. And then these signatures start. The first one to sign was the president of the Congress, John Hancock. And you can see his signature much larger than the others. Some of you may have heard that John Hancock said, I'm going to write my signature so large that King George will not need his spectacles to read it. If any of you have heard that, sorry, guys, it's not true. That's just one of these myths, and there's a lot of them. There, I actually think that they're kind of fun, and we're, we're gonna we're going to go over um, a couple more. So, but here here's another quiz. What word in the Declaration of Independence is not in the Declaration of Independence? Just think about this for a second. What word in the Declaration of Independence is not in the Declaration of Independence? You ready for this? How about the word independence? We, we, we call it that, but it, the word independence is nowhere on that document. Let's go to the second painting, the Saratoga Campaign. This is a battle where we defeat the British. General Burgoyne surrenders his over 5,000 man army. This was an extraordinary victory. And this also was the turning point of the war no one realized it yet. And why was this the turning point? Why was this victory so important? Well, we needed help. And we knew we needed help. And the country to help us actually was France for various reasons. I mean, so Ben Franklin is living in Paris trying to persuade the King Louis the 16th to help us. John Adams goes there, uh, uh, just all kinds of people. And Louis the 16th kept on saying, I need to see something that convinces me that you guys have a chance against the British. Well, the victory at Saratoga was the sign that Louis saw, which convinced him to sign a treaty of amity and, uh, and, and, and other um, alliances with us. This wins us the war. France sends over troops, weapons, food, gold, and ships. We didn't have a Navy to speak of and ships, and that made all the difference. That's why that victory at Saratoga was so important. But while we're on the subject of Louis the 16th, on your screen, on the right side, is a woman. She's Louis the 16th's wife, the Queen of France. Who is she? Who's the one French queen we all seem to remember? I'm sure many, maybe all of you said Marie Antoinette, and of course that is correct. What is she famous for having said? Most people, when I ask this, the answer is let them eat cake. Well, folks, she never said it. Nope. This is just another one of these myths. There's about 10 million explanations of what those words mean, but there's no proof that she ever actually said those words. This is a sculpture, obviously another form of the fine arts. This is sculptures in the Morristown Green, the center of Morristown, which is not that far for you guys. So what is going on here? Most people, if they even see this at all, they recognize George Washington. He's the one on, on the screen on your right. The one in the middle is Alexander Hamilton. And the one talking to Washington is the Marquis de Lafayette. Now, this sculpture represents France signing a treaty of amity and alliance with us, with, which wins us the war. On the surface, what is happening is the Marquis de Lafayette, who had also been in France to persuade Louis XVI to help us, has come back. Washington is living in the Ford Mansion in Morristown. This is his second winter encampment, May of 1780. The man in the middle is Alexander Hamilton, Washington's chief of staff. And of course, the third man, the Marquis de Lafayette, who is telling Washington, my king will now support you 
And that means that we wind up getting our um, independence thanks to France. It's a wonderful, wonderful sculpture. The next time you're in the Morristown Green, just, just kind of walk up to it. By the way, they're all to size. Washington was 6'2", Hamilton was about 5'6", and Marquis Lafayette was about six feet tall. And it, it, it's just a wonderful representation, I call it, of independence. Because without France, we might all be speaking with a thick British accent today. The third painting, The Surrender of British at Yorktown. This was the last major battle of the war. Uh, the British surrender, thanks to the help, thank because of the French and the French fleet, which bottled up the British in Yorktown, and at the same time kept British relief from getting to Yorktown. So if you look, most people, if they even see this, focus on the center, you see the guy in the hat on the white horse, and you assume that's George Washington accepting the surrender from the British. Only it's not. You see, in the morning of the surrender, the British General Cornwallis sends Washington a note saying he doesn't feel well, and he's not going to be there, and the second in command of General O'Hara will be surrendering. Well, Washington was a stickler for protocol, so he feels he cannot accept a surrender from someone of a lesser rank than he is. So he sends one of his generals, General Lincoln, by the way, no relation to Abraham Lincoln. And so that is really who's in the center of this painting. But if you look kind of to right center, I'm going to blow this up. Sitting on that horse, there is George Washington. This is a clearer picture of it. And I want to show you right there in front of the horse. That's Alexander Hamilton. Look at, now remember, this is a painting and, and I've expanded it, but look at the clarity. The, these artists are unbelievably fabulous. And in the center of those three men, in the center is the Marquis de Lafayette. And just to his right on your screen um, is Baron von Steuben, just so you know. If he does this, he will be the greatest man in the world. This is... King George talking to the American painter, Benjamin West, who I'm going to talk about in a moment. And what is happening is Washington is resigning his commission. In other words, he is voluntarily giving up power. Washington could have been anything he wanted. He could have declared himself king, you name it. Napoleon declared himself emperor. Washington had no designs on power. He just wanted to go back to Mount Vernon. And he wanted to be sure that everyone, especially Europeans, understood that his fight, independence, was not about him, was not about retaining power. And so he resigns his commission. Now, this is an engraving, another form of the arts, of that painting. And pretty much every lecture or every time I'm giving this lecture in person, I always see somebody start to reach for their wallet or their purse. You know why? Because they recognize this engraving because that's what's on the back of a $5,000 bill. <laughs> so when I'm done with this lecture, you can all pull out your $5,000 bills to verify what I just said. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever gone up to New Haven to the Yale University Art Gallery. First of all, it's a fabulous art gallery. It's completely free, but inside are original paintings by John Trumbull, the artist we're talking about, including smaller ones of the four that I just talked to you about. John Trumbull loved New Haven, loved the art museum. If you ever go up the Merritt Parkway, you'll pass Trumbull, Connecticut. That's not named after the painter who we're talking about. That's his father also named John Trumbull, who was an early governor of Connecticut. Trumbull loved New Haven and the art museum so much, he is buried underneath the art museum. You, if you go there, you will see this uh, in the floor. Now, I mentioned the painter Benjamin West. Benjamin West was born in Philadelphia, but back in the time when everybody was British, the idea of separation just, just wasn't, you know, 
uh, no one was, was even thinking about it. And he was really good. And he goes to England and he's recognized as being an absolute superb artist. And he becomes the painter to the king. And so all during the Revolutionary War, he does his paintings, but he stays out of politics. He becomes friends with King George. And so King George, at, when the war is over, Benjamin West gets a commission to paint the signing of the, of the peace treaty. And this is his painting, unfinished. So everybody recognizes Ben Franklin. And again, looking on your screen, to the left of Franklin sitting there is John Adams. But what's with, why wasn't it finished? Well, the two British signers show up and they look and they say, uh, why is there a painter here? Well, we're going to do a painting for posterity. And the two painters say, not with our faces, you're not. And they sign and they run out. So poor Benjamin West, he's like flummox. It's like, how am I going to get paid if I can't finish the painting? Well, John Adams, he thought this was about the funniest thing that he'd ever seen. He winds up buying the unfinished painting from Benjamin West, and he had it shipped to his home in Massachusetts. Eventually, it was bought by a member of the DuPont family, and you can see it today at the Winter Thur Museum in Delaware. Now let's look at another artist of that period, Charles Wilson Peel. And yes, there are two L's in Wilson. Someone asked me that, and it is correct. He was the first artist to paint George Washington from life. He went down to Mount Vernon, met with Washington, discussed Washington, said how he wanted to appear, and he's in his French and Indian War uniform. These paintings of Washington were extraordinarily powerful and important because remember there's no television there's no you know cnn or internet so pe the, the citizens of this country it was these images that brought the war home to them because to hear about it just isn't the same as seeing something and so these images of washington that was kind of the glue that held the 13 colonies together. Now the people, could they could see what they were fighting for through Washington. So he becomes the personal embodiment of the Revolutionary War. Now, you know, the world we live in today, we are inundated with images. You cannot turn your head and not see something. You're, going, you're in your car, billboards, television, and on and on and on and on. It wasn't like that back then. These images were extraordinarily powerful. So this one was done by Charles Wilson Peel, and it's hanging in the uh, uh, State House in Pennsylvania, which is today Independence Hall. And a loyalist, right, someone loyal to the crown, was really upset. And he, he couldn't physically attack George Washington, so he breaks into the State House and he attacks the picture of George Washington. This is the kind of emotions that these paintings uh, 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 had pe uh, got people to express. So Charles Wilson Peel had to go back in and repair the painting, which he did. But that, that's the power of these paintings. Let me tell you another story about Charles Wilson Peel. This is a family portrait. Now the artist himself is in the upper left corner looking down, but he's not the focus of this. This is a family portrait and the real focus is in the center. You see a woman kind of supporting a little girl. Well, the woman is Charles Wilson Peel's wife, Rachel, and the child she's supporting is their fourth child, a daughter named Margaret. And it's a, it's a wonderful, happy family scene. And what makes it even happier is this. Charles Wilson Peel and Margaret's first three children all died in infancy. So here's Margaret, right? Beautiful, happy. So I'm, I'm working on some other things and I came across this and I actually kind of stopped in my tracks because I have never seen an image, a face that was so peaceful and calm. I mean, just look at this face. 
And so I had to, I really had to find out what it was about, just, just the artistry. And so this is a little bit more of it. And so now I'm saying to myself, well, now, wait a minute. What's with the ribbon tied around the wrist, extending over the, uh, uh, the waist? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, that's Margaret. And Margaret has also died. She died of smallpox, which is a horrible way to die. So this is called a memorialized painting. It's a painting an artist does as, as a way of remembering whoever had died, the way they want to think about them, the way they want to remember them. Uh, it's called Rachel Weeping. You can see this painting, the original, in the Philadelphia Museum of Fine Arts. It's extraordinarily powerful. Anybody remember P.T. Barnum, the showman extraordinaire? Well, before P.T. Barnum, there was Charles Wilson Peel, who establishes the first natural history museum in the United States. This is a self-portrait, by the way, of Peel when he was 80 years old. And he's kind of raising the curtain for the world to see this museum that, that he created. Now, this is the second National Bank building in historic Philadelphia. If you ever go down there, go to this building inside of which you'll see over 100 original Charles Wilson Peel portraits. I, I took this picture. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful place run by the National Park Service. Uh, I always recommend if you're going to any place run by the Park Service, go online, check first to make sure the, the hours that there isn't something special going on, etc. Now, I collect autographs, as I said, this is a second one, and there's going to be another one. In the center of this document, you see where it says Charles Peel. So there's his signature, but that's not why I'm showing you this. What I decided to do was take original paintings of Washington done by Charles Wilson Peel and arrange them by date. So you start in the lower left, go up one, oh, I'll go up one, go over four. Those are all by Charles Wilson Peel. You can you can see Washington actually aging, which of course you would expect. But look at the the one on the bottom right, Rembrandt Peel. Charles Wilson Peel had sons, and he all and he named them after artists. And so there was a Rembrandt Peel and a Rubens Peel, etc. Well, Rembrandt Peel, in his own right, became a very successful and well known painter back then. This is, generally speaking, the quintessential Thomas Jefferson. If you go on the internet, you Google Thomas Jefferson. This is the image, the painting that comes up the most. And this was also done by Rembrandt Peel of George Washington in person. Now let's talk about another one of these artists, a man named Gilbert Stewart. Recognize the image on the easel? Well, most people do. The story behind this is fabulous. It's because of Martha that the image of, that this particular image of George Washington e exists today and is on the course of the $1 bill. So in 1796, Martha goes to Gilbert Stewart and says, Mr. Stewart, I want you to do a portrait of the general just like the one you did last year. And by the way, the painting she's referring to has been lost. No one knows what ever happened to that. Well, Gilbert Stewart says, of course, no, no problem. And so they, they negotiate a price. And Martha, Martha says, oh, and by the way, when you're finished with the painting, you will give it to me. Because Washington's, and Washington's never going to sit again. And so basically, it's, this is going to be a, um, a one-off painting. In other words, Peel cannot make, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Gilbert Stewart cannot make any more except one. So he starts painting and a lot of people come by and they see it and they want one also. Well, this is like the holy grail of painting. He's created something that other people want that he can sell except he can't because he promised Martha that when he finished the painting, he would give it to her. What to do? Well, he comes up with a pretty ingenious solution. So he does Washington, you can see on your screen. And then he says, you know, General, 
I'm really finished with you. I just need to fill in the background. There's no reason for you to sit here any longer. And of course, Washington was really happy to get out of there. He hated to sit for portraits. And Gilbert Stewart, quite possibly, or at least in my imagination, took the unfinished painting. Maybe he put it in the seat where Washington was actually sitting. He then proceeded to paint over 100 more of these portraits. He sold them all. Now, these 100 plus, he fills in the background. But the original, he never filled in the background, which hence he never finished it. And so he never gave it to Martha. It is shared between the Boston Fine Arts Museum and the Smithsonian. Uh, I was in Boston, uh, actually, uh, 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 the week of July 4th, just, just a couple of weeks ago. It was, pretty, it was pretty cool, by the way. Anyway, so I went to the museum to look at the painting. And unfortunately, all I got to look at was an empty frame. <laughs> it seems as though the painting was on loan. At any rate, the mirror image is, of course, what's on a $1 bill. And it's because of Martha that we have that image. The War of 1812 was kind of a, a strange war, as Harry Truman called it, the silliest damn war we ever had. But towards the end of that war, the British Navy attacks our nation's capital. Some of the buildings were burnt to the ground. Some were partially destroyed, like the White House. President was James Madison. His wife was Dolly Madison. And this is a portrait of Dolly Madison done by Gilbert Stewart. And so the British are getting closer. And James Madison says to Dolly, OK, we have to leave. The British are getting very close. And she says, you go. I'm not leaving until I absolutely have to. So Madison leaves with his cabinet. But the British get so close that Dolly realizes she has to leave also. So she looks around, you know, kind of like a one last look. And she sees this life-size oil paint of George Washington on the wall. And she knows if the British get their hands on that. They can turn it into a major propaganda piece. So last minute, she has it taken now off the wall, taken out of the frame, rolled up, taken to safety. You can see it today at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., done by Gilbert Stewart. So I always like to say Dolly Madison saved George Washington. This is another form of the arts. We call this a photograph. It's an early form of a photograph called a daguerreotype. This is Dolly Madison at the age of 80. Look at this woman. I don't know about you, but I still see a formidable person. Besides, how can you not love a woman that has ice cream named after her? Who else did Gilbert Stewart paint? Well, kind of the quintessential Martha Washington. This is the earliest known image of Martha. Her maiden name was Dandridge. She was eight years old when this was painted. And this is the, for the moment, unless something else comes up, the final painting done of Martha. This was done in 1801, and she died in 1802. And lastly, the first artist we spoke about was John Trumbull. And so this is John Trumbull as painted by the second or a third artist we spoke about, Gilbert Stewart. This is a map of North America circa 1753. Now you see the 13 colonies where it says Great Britain. You see all the land France controls. And between the two is this disputed area that both countries claim. So the colony of Virginia getting word that the French are building fortifications in that area sends some of their militia, which are basically the only military uh, force there was back back then, there was no standing army, to tell the French to leave. And this militia is led by 21-year-old militia Major George Washington. You may recognize the clothes that he's wearing. The French disagree. Washington returns. The following year, he goes back. He has more men with him. There's a firefight. Men are killed. This is the beginning of what we call the French and Indian War. Well, Virginia requests and receives an actual army from Britain. They would have looked something like this, beautifully dressed, fully equipped. One of the most successful fighting forces in the world at that particular point in time. 
And they have to fight alongside the militia who were pretty much the opposite in just about every way. And so the British regulars had nothing but contempt and disdain for the militia, and they ridiculed the militia mercilessly. And how did they do that? They did that with a song called Yankee Doodle. Folks, I know I can't hear you, but on the count of three, I want you all to start singing Yankee Doodle. One, two, three, begin. Riding on a, in his hat. All right, you can stop. That's enough. <laughs> I gave this lecture a couple of days ago in person. And it, every time I give it, actually, it, it always amazes me how many people remember the melody and in a lot of cases remember the words. And when, and I'm sure the same for you on this virtual lecture. So when was the last time you sang this song? When was the last time you even thought about this song? Usually it's measured in decades, not words. I always find it amazing how it's it like it just comes back, right? It's like in our DNA. And speaking of words, what do the words mean? Well, what's a Yankee? Now, someone always says a baseball player, so please don't 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 say baseball player. A Yankee is a, a, a derogatory term used by the British against the colonists. And what's a doodle? Well, kind of a just a simpleton. So Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Okay, this just makes sense, right? Stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. What does pasta have to do with anything? Well, in colonial times, if you were the height, the epitome of Italian fashion, you were called a macaroni. And so what this song is saying, look at these colonists. They are so dumb. They think that by putting a feather in their hat, it makes them the height of fashion. And that's what those words mean. And of course, it goes from a song of ridicule to the whole idea um, of a patriotic song. Now let's talk about the fine arts as influencers. Before TikTok and before Instagram, there was the pamphlet, the painting, and the poem. The pamphlet is called Common Sense, published by Thomas Paine in January of 1776. The country was kind of divided into thirds. A third was for independence, a third was against, and a third wasn't sure. Part of the problem was the philosophy that kind of that brings about almost the independence idea called the Enlightenment. You know, you listen to philosophers and they, they say 20 words where the rest of us say two. And so the average person really didn't quite understand a lot of what was going on or why we should. Uh, separate from the crown or why we should stay loyal. And here comes Thomas Paine and he takes this argument and he writes it in clear, simple, easy to understand language, language of the people. It's common sense to declare independence from Great Britain. Men should not petition for rights, but take them. This is kind of simple words, simple concepts, something everybody could understand. Hugely influential, hugely influential. One historian that I, I read said, if it wasn't for Thomas Paine, there might not even have been a uh, revolution. Thomas Paine also wrote another pamphlet when Washington was on the other side of the Delaware, trying to figure out what to do to keep his army together. This was before he crosses back over in the Battle of Trenton. Thomas Paine writes another pamphlet called The American Crisis. The opening line of this pamphlet, these are the times that try men's souls. Some of you may have heard this over the years. Uh, it, 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 was, it was in a popular Kingston Trio song. Franklin Roosevelt used those words in one of his fireside chats in World War II. Thomas Paine is still around. There's another park in Morristown. Actually, it's just a 10-minute walk from the green, so it's really close by called Burnham Park, and there's a statue. You can see the back of it. That is Thomas Paine. And he is writing on that scroll, these are the times that try men's souls. And of course, I mentioned earlier, the Kingston Trio, they had a song called the MTA. 
This was a big hit in 1961. The opening line of this song. These are the times that try men's souls. So that was the pamphlet. Let's talk about the painting. Washington crossing the Delaware. This painting was not meant to be an accurate representation of an event. It's actually an allegory. So you're seeing one thing, but there's a hidden meaning. The German painter Emanuel Lloyd, so he studied art in America, he's back in Europe. Some political changes are trying to happen in Europe. And so Lloyd so uses the event of Washington crossing the Delaware to show that if people work together, anything is possible. That's kind of the hidden meaning. So a lot of this painting is incorrect in terms of facts, but again, that's okay. Now, I don't have time to go through all, all, all the discrepancies. I have another lecture that I wrote called The Whole Story, and then I do talk about them. And another, the poem, is the same situation. It's also an allegory. The story is one thing, but the reality is something else. In this case, we're talking a poem, of course, written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So why did Longfellow write this poem? I call it a poem of parallels. The original ride was to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams who were hiding in Lexington that the British are on their way to try to arrest them and to warn Con uh, 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 that Lexington conquered the Sons of Liberty have weapons and other military stores there. And so the, the people, the Sons of Liberty there, need to be warned the British are on the way. So, so warning. The poem was a warning. The poem was a warning. And the warning was about slavery. The poem was published in January of 1861. It was written in 1860. I'm going to just read you a little bit of the poem because it is absolute genius. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive. Think about this for a moment. The event took place in 1775. The poem was written in 1860. That's 85 years. You bet there's hardly a man still alive. I mean, I'm going to the end of the poem now. Born on the night wind of the past, right? 85 years earlier. In the hour of darkness and peril and need. So this is what Longfellow was seeing. And this is the purpose of his poem. He's trying to wake the people up. The people will wake it and listen to hear. He's trying to wake them up and say, we got to do something or else we're going to have a civil war over the issue of slavery. And it might destroy the Union. The midnight message. Midnight. No time left. The poem is fabulous. But it's not accurate. For one thing, and I'm going to just give you one part, but I also talk about the poem in depth in my other lecture, uh, the whole story. Paul Revere did not send, does, does not go up to the top of the belfry and swing two lanterns. Nor is Paul Revere waiting on the other side of the Charles River to see if one or two lanterns are going to be shown in the belfry. That, that's it. In the poem, he's on the other side of the Charles River waiting for a signal so he knows which way the British are coming. But if the, that's not reality. So I'm going to let that go there. But I want to talk about is the real ride, because the real ride is pretty fascinating, too. And it all begins with this man, Dr. Joseph Warren. Now, this is a portrait done by another one of the painters of that period, John Singleton Copley. Warren is the head of the Sons of Liberty in Boston because, as I just said, the other two heads, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, are in hiding in Lexington. Warren has a spy in British headquarters. Now, to this day, nobody knows who the spy is. Well, the spy alerts Warren that the British are going to go out to Lexington and Concord, and so he calls in his favorite writer, Paul Revere, to warn both places. But then... Warren says, well, now, wait a minute. There are random British patrols out, and they often, what if one of them stops Paul Revere? Who's going to get to Lexington or Concord? So he calls in a second writer, a man named William Dawes. And so they both go out. They just took different routes. Trouble is, William Dawes was not in the poem. So nobody ever heard of William Dawes. Now, I mentioned earlier the painter John Singleton Copley. It just, I, it just so happens he did the, the, the iconic, the quintessential paintings of the main 
players in Paul Revere's ride. As I said earlier, this is his John saying, this is a Joseph, Dr. Joseph Warren. You look, if you get, if you go on the internet, these, these are the images that you're going to see the most. Again, by John Singleton Copley, Paul Revere, and John Hancock, and Samuel Adams. Engraving is another form of the arts. And this is an, an engraver named Henry Pelham. And he's the one who actually did the engraving that we call the Boston Massacre. He did this, he was gonna, he printed off copies, he was gonna sell them, but for whatever the reasons, he never really sold many and they just kind of lay on a shelf. And a second engraver comes by and sees it and says, hey, wait a minute, I can make some subtle changes and turn this into a major propaganda piece. And he does, and it becomes a bestseller. And so I, I wanna show you what, what the second engraver did. So I combine these two. Now on your screen on the left, we're gonna blow this up. You see basically a wall and windows, right? Now that same space, the second engraver, look what he does. He puts a sign on that wall and the sign says butcher's hall. Get it? The British are butchering your friends and neighbors. So here's your little quiz. Who was the second engraver? You ready? Paul Revere. Paul Revere did a lot more than just ride a horse. I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to talk really fast. I want to talk about Benedict Arnold for just a moment. So Benedict Arnold, of course, most famous trader and fortune, and famous is not, not a good word, maybe infamous trader uh, of our country. And long after his death, like 100 plus years, becomes the issue of markers, historical markers. You know, they're all over the place. And they're actually pretty cool. And they, 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 they kind of uh, um, acknowledge, celebrate um, um, an event, a person, whatever. And so the question becomes, do you mention Benedict Arnold by name where he was instrumental in the success? And so I'm going to go through this quickly. Capture of Fort Ticonderoga, he was actually, a, I'm going to use the term co-captain. Well, the other captain was a man named Ethan Allen. And he, and you can see in this marker, they mention Ethan Allen, but they don't mention Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was up and trying to capture Quebec City. Here's a marker that does mention Benedict Arnold. In that, he shot in the leg. And I'm telling you this for a reason that you'll see why in a moment. Washington turns to Arnold and says, the British are sending a fleet of ships down from Canada down, uh, and I, I need you to stop them. And so Arnold builds a little fleet of gunboats. He had experience uh, in sailing, and he delays the British long enough that they're not able to achieve their uh, objective. And so the Battle of Alcor Island, so here mentions Benedict Arnold by name, and here does not. Now, I showed you this painting earlier. Surrender of General Burgoyne. The hero of that victory was Benedict Arnold. The man who took the credit was General Gates, and that's another long story. But the hero was Benedict Arnold. And by the way, he was shot in the leg, the same leg that he was shot in up in Saratoga. So there's a commission form at the Saratoga National Historical Park. What do we do about the hero? who was a traitor. Do we mention his name or not? And they do not. Instead, they, <laughs> they've mentioned his leg. This is called the Boot Monument. And if you go to Saratoga National Historical Park, ironically, I'm going to be there in about a week and a half. This is what you will see. I cannot tell a lie. I did not cut down the cherry tree. It's a lot of other myths and legends, etc. And one of them is George Washington and the hatchet and the cherry tree. We know where this came from. It all starts with this man named Mason Locke Weems, Parson Weems is a minister. Uh, after Washington had died, he wrote a book, a little booklet, and each chapter talks about one of George Washington's attributes. And it was really designed for younger readers. This is the artist Grant Wood. Many of you know what his most famous painting was. It's called American Gothic. 
I'm going to take a little side trip here for a moment. Have any of you been down to Grounds for Sculpture? Pretty cool place. But if you ever go there, you will see this really big <laughs> American goth. I don't know who, who uh, the young lady is, but uh, this thing must be 20 feet tall. And by the way, I'm not sure is this the next one I'm going to show you was there anymore. But here I am holding on to Marilyn Monroe's calf. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to Grant Wood. Grant Wood also did a painting called Parson Weems' Fable. <clears throat> so you see Parson Weems. Look at his finger pointing to George Washington holding the axe. And George is saying to his father, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. But let's take a closer look at George Washington, because there is Gilbert Stewart's 66-year-old head on a six-year-old body. <laughs> so, so what is Grant Wood trying to say? Well, in my opinion, he is saying George Washington is ageless, George Washington is timeless, and George Washington orders you to attend my next lecture. So he started this lecture with this autograph. I have one last one to show you. This is a record album autographed by Elvis Presley. Now, why am I showing you Elvis Presley? Because on behalf of myself and the real king, get it, get it, the real king? Thank you, thank you very much.